Okay, so Baruch Hashem. So uh, translation is like kissing a bride through a veil. So I don't use the word faith, I use the word emuna, because emuna is the Torah's word for complete belief in Hashem. Complete belief in Hashem, it's when you sink your soul, your divine soul, like we learned in our three introductory lessons, uh, divine soul with Hashem. Now, for those who missed our introductory lessons, so they, each lesson is like a separate module. But if you want to go back and pick them up, you could do it in one of two places. Either go on emunabeams.com, E-M-U-N-A-B-E-A-M-S.com, or go on laserbrody.net and go on the category of Amuna Hour, click on Amuna Hour, and you can go and get the replays of all the, the previous shirim. Okay, so what we're doing together, we're learning the 13 principles of faith in depth, but on eye level. And for, I looked all around, from what I know, there is the only time I ever saw that anyone teach that was my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Noah Weinberg in Asian Torah. But since then, I haven't seen anyone with a, a, a really clear cut, easy to understand explanation of 13 principles of Amuna. And many religious people don't know what they believe in, what they're supposed to believe in. So we're going to get, this brings us close to Hashem. That's Amuna is a pure and complete belief. Why do we often learn Amuna? Because since our emotions come from the soul, the soul is a tiny part of Hashem. If the soul is not synchronized with its maker, it's like a Wi-Fi. Soul works on Wi-Fi. The phone has the Wi-Fi connection with its maker. If you turn off your Wi-Fi, you're not going to you're not going to be connected to the net. Okay, this is just the perfect example of the soul connection. Why does Hashem give us Wi-Fi and give us Google search? People don't believe in, in, in the heavenly court that everything is done like what our sages said 2,000 years ago in, in tractate of, of Ethics of the Fathers, uh, that everything is recorded. Everything is recorded. To go in Google. You can see every, everything. You're going to go. Okay, so last week we learned that everything is from Hashem, the first principle. Okay, he alone did, does, and will do. Principle number two is the principle of divine unity, what we're going to learn tonight. This is a very important principle. Okay, this principle in particular for the Jewish people, this is the secret of the Jewish people's survival all these years, not because of high tech and not because of weaponry and not because of any other thing. It's because knowing the principle of divine unity. The Rambam's principle number two says, I believe with complete belief that the creator, blessed be he, is one, his name is one, one, that's it. And there is no unity like him under any circumstances. And he alone is our God, past, present, future. We're going to learn tonight what is complete unity. What's unity? And we you know the Hashem has, has, has different names. We say the word Hashem, for those who are new to Emuna, Hashem means in Hebrew the name. Because the third commandment of the Ten Commandments is not to take Hashem's name in vain. So therefore, we avoid saying God or uh, Elohim. I say it with a K. It's really said with a He. Uh, or A-D-O-N-I-A. We say Hashem. We avoid saying Hashem's name outside the context of prayer or Torah learning. Okay, because then that's when we're very careful not to, not to go to the Ten Commandments. And that's why in all of mankind, uh, people are, you have to keep a clean tongue. And people that curse and say curse words, they violate the third commandment backwards and forward. And the third commandment, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the, something that all of humanity accepts. So, they're, 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 <laughs> so uh, once again, principle number two, I believe with complete belief that the Creator, blessed be He, His name is one, and there is no unity like Him under any circumstances, and He alone is our God, past, present, and future. This is the belief that the creator is one perfect, inseparable whole, not parts, not put together, but Hashem is one and he's independent of everyone and everything is not dependent on anything. And he's perfectly unified. And this is what we say in the Shema prayer and the Shema prayer that this is why I said kept the Jewish people alive. They, for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, Jews have this three times a day on their tongue. They go to their death with this in their mouth. Even Jews that not necessarily religious, there's stories all in the Holocaust about in the gas chambers, religious, non-religious, that all they did, they put right before as the Nazis hit, they, 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 their name should be forgotten and wiped off history. But as they turned on the gas, everybody yelled Shema Yisrael. 
And this is, this is the way this is the way that Jews live. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our spiritual DNA. And so we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What do we say? The Lord is one. We say, everybody says, since you're a little kid, you learn to say Shema. But what does it mean? The Lord is one. That's what we're learning tonight. You don't understand the Lord is one. Okay, we're monotheists. It means that we don't have idolatry, that we don't believe in other deities. It's not like Greek uh, or the, the, um, the mythology that they have a, a God for this and a God for that and a God for that and a God for that. There's a God for baseball and a God for football and a God for basketball. <laughs> don't laugh because they're the people that, you know, they have their, their icons, their sports idols, an idol for this and an idol that. It wouldn't make anything into an idol is idolatry. Now, don't get it wrong. Some of history's most brilliant minds misconstrue, misconstrue the concept of one perfect whole, inseparable whole that's perfectly unified. What we learn here in the, in the Rambam's second principle. And we're talking about the heart and soul of monotheism. So if someone's monotheistic, this is, this is really what he believes in. So the principle of divine unity, as I said, I stress all the time, it's universal. When I'm, I'm not talking about, Jew, I'm talking about universal monotheism. I'm not going to be talking about Jewish faith. I'm not going to talk about putting on tefillin or laws of milk and meat. I'm talking about belief in God. This is universal monotheism. Okay, but why do great minds and intellectuals, you know, there are a lot of agnostic and atheistic, and they, why do they, 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 they make this mistake and they fail to understand the notion of divine unity? You know why they fail to understand? Because it defies intellect. You can't some, understand something that is ultra intellectual, ultra not much, ultra means above, supra intellectual, above the intellect, with the intellect. <laughs> In other words, with your way of walking, you can't get to 5,000 feet. You can't take off in the air and walk in the air or walk in the water. You're walking, you're walking. So a person cannot understand spirituality with the intellectual brain. You have to go one step further, go into a spiritual mindset. The spiritual mindset, I'm going to the end. The spiritual mindset is a muna. A muna takes a person into a spiritual mindset because in a muna, there's a whole set of laws, set of muna laws, what we're learning that defy the intellect, they defy logic, but they don't go together with logic. It, it, it just doesn't go, it doesn't go. Logic cannot understand what we learned last week, that everything is for the good. Because logic says, what are you talking about? How can coronavirus be for the good? How can war be for the good? But with Amuna, you can understand. Like they do a whole separate thing. I gave, if you look on amunabeams.com, there's three lessons how the benefits of coronavirus, what it's done for people. Okay, but uh, this is after, in order to hear the lesson, you have to go into the Amuna mindset. In other words, look at the world through eyeglasses of Amuna, the rose-colored glasses, the eyeglasses of Amuna. Okay, if you have eyeglasses of intellect, take them off, change the glasses, put on eyeglasses of Amuna. Now, to help understand this, okay, I want to bring it home, and I'm going to tell a really poignant story from the Gomorrah. Many of you have studied Gomorrah, you've probably heard this story, but Never the real, people don't know the real explanation. Uh, there is a tractate Chagiga on page 14b. There's a story of Rebbe Akiva and three of his colleagues. One was Ben Azai, and one was Ben Zoma, and one was Elisha Ben Abuya. These are four prodigious minds. They're Tanaic sages, sages at the time. This is, we're talking about the time between the destruction of the Second Temple. It was 1968 years ago, and Bar Kokhba's revolt, that was, uh, Bar Kokhba's revolt was in 135. Bar Kokhba's revolt was 67 years after the destruction of the temple. Okay, so these 67 years was a terribly difficult time for the Jewish people in the land of Israel. It was Roman occupation, and it was with an iron boot occupation. It was very terrible, and it was much persecution, and Torah could be, it was a time when Torah learning was outlawed when it was the greatest in history. Yeah, that's it with a Jew. If you want a Jew to do something, outlaw it, okay? <laughs> it's in, in Israel, they, they, our kids, they, they were you know, they're learning as, as soon as the government said no school, oh, now they want to go to school. Now they want to go to cheder, okay? And they're learning, it's action, and, and the haters are learning in the basement and learn they're playing cat and mouse with the police. Oh, the kids are loving it. Okay, this is, if you want a Jew to learn Torah, tell him it's outlawed. OK, 
Okay, no, no, we're Torah. So the Gemara, and, and it tells about a story from this time. And these four prodigious minds, Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Akiva is that the whole Talmud stems from Rebbe Akiva. Because Rebbe Akiva, he learned with the two great teachers, Rebbe Yeshua ben Hananiah and Rebbe Eliezer the Great, Rebbe Eliezer of Horkinus. And all the religious law comes from them, comes down through Rebbe Akiva, and Rebbe Akiva passed it on to his five Talmudim. I don't want to get bogged down. Let's stick to the story. Okay, so Rebbe Akiva is he's the greatest mind, not only of his generation, but he's the greatest mind since Moses until the end of time. Rebbe Akiva, unbelievable mind. But also Ben Zoma and Ben Azai, they were great minds. The Gemara says Ben Azai, if you take all the scholars of his time and put them in one hand, Ben Azai's intellect, it, it weighs more than they do. They were unbelievable. Ben Zoma, unbelievable intellect. Ben Zoma would talk and it was so, it, it was so illuminating that he would have tens of thousands of people gather around him in Tiberias, when he would give, he would give a speech every, every Shabbat in the afternoon. People would sleep. They'd go, they wouldn't listen to Ben Azai. And Elisha Ben Abuya, Elisha Ben Abuya had a bad end, but Elisha Ben Abuya, he was the teacher of Rebbe Meir Balanis. So he was no lightweight. They were all heavyweights. Okay. So what does the story tell us? The, the story, the Gemara has talked, sometimes the Gemara is more cryptic than the Zohar. The Gemara is more cryptic than Kabbalah. The Gemara says they walked into an orchard. What does it mean? Albanek the Sula Panta is the four of them walked into an orchard. What's Gamora talking about? An orchard is talking whenever they talk about an orchard, Paldes, it's talking about the esoteric Torah. This is the great, great granddaddy of Kabbalah. This is the divine secrets that are so high that many of the angels don't know them. They don't know them at all. But they, this is their minds that go. It's okay. So they decided they get together and they would invoke secret divine names that people don't know, and they would uplift their souls to a level that trans transcend the physical world. And this is what they want to do, okay? So they're talking about the four greatest minds, and they get together, and they're having a party. What's a party for them? A party for them. Let's go and, and, and see what's going on in the upper worlds. This is not the only time that it's done, okay? This is the debate that was done a, a couple other times, okay? So Rebbe Akiva and Ben Azai and Ben, Z ben Zoma and Elisha Ben Abuya, okay? But Rebbe Akiva, he warned them. Rebbe Akiva, he warned them. He said, when you get to the place of the marble stone, don't scream water, water. <laughs> Cryptic? <laughs> okay, what's talking about? If we, where do we see marble juxtaposed with water? If we look at how King Solomon built the first holy temple, King Solomon made a floor of marble that was so gorgeous that when the sun shined on it, it would look like waves, waves in the ocean. This blue, white, gray marble, and the sun would shine on it, and you would think you were walking on water. Okay, so Rebbe Akiva, he was, and, and where did King Solomon get this idea? Then that King Solomon was the wisest man ever walked the face of the earth. King Solomon was an unbelievable Kabbalist. He knew the secrets of Torah. Okay, so Rebbe Akiva knew that there's no physicality in the upper realm, but Rebbe Akiva knew that there was a partition between the physical realm and the spiritual realm, the upper realm, the lower realm where we are, and the upper realm where there's many of them, but Rebbe Akiva knew there was a partition but the partition is an illusion. It's an optical illusion, okay? It looks like a marble wall, but it's the same type of marble that King Solomon, this is what King Solomon knew this, King Solomon wanted to make the holy temple look like it was a part of the upper world, okay? These are, you have to really go deep into the Gemara to find this out. The, the, the Rashi doesn't explain this. We go to other, the, the Kabbalistic interpretation of the Gemara to learn this and to learn this Gemara, and we'll see why, why we're learning this. Okay, so Rebbe Akiva warned them. He said, what Rebbe Akiva was saying is, listen, guys, you don't go upstairs with physical intellect. We're not going in the physical world. We're leaving the physical world. And he warned them. But they didn't understand Rebbe Akiva's warning. They didn't understand. And they were not prepared for what they were about to see. Rebbe Akiva was the only one who was prepared about to see. So it was 
Rebbe Kiva, the Gemara says, Nechnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom. Rebbe Kiva entered the upper realm in peace, and he left in peace. He was able to leave. And it's even a greater, greater miracle than entering the upper realm was being able to leave it. Because what happened with Ben Azai? Ben Azai took a glance at the upper world and he saw divine light and his soul said, bye bye, I'm not staying in this body. I'm not going back to that world. <laughs> with his divine light, his soul left his body right away and clung to the light. As you imagine, take a match. If you want to see how this works, take a match and put it in front of a bigger flame or take a candle and put it in front of a bonfire. You will see how the small fire nullifies itself just to a candle. And this is what King Solomon says, Ne'er Hashem Nishmas Adam, he says that the, the uh, candle of God is the human soul. And that's exactly what he means because imagine that divinity is like a great fire and we have the spark, this little candle inside. And the Gemara calls it a candle because the Gemara says, as long as the candle is burning, you can correct. What's it talking about? The Gemara says, as long as a person is alive, he can make a soul correction. Even if he's 95 years old, 105 years old, and he decides to make a soul correction, he can still do it, as long as the candle is burning. Okay, so what uh, Rabbi Akiva, he warned them, don't be physical, okay? Ben Zoma's candle saw the big candle, boom, bye-bye. Excuse me, Ben Azai. Ben Azai, so Ben Azai died right on the spot. He seats for men, that's what the Gemara says. He, he had one glance, one glance at divinity and he was finished. Then comes Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma had a tremendous mind. Imagine that Ben Zoma's mind was 10,000 watts, but the light he saw was a million watts. Okay, if you take, uh, not by way of transformer, from your power station, direct electricity to your 60 watt light bulbs are all gonna explode. That's why you have transformer, a transformer station, and you have circuit breakers on your street to bring down this, bring down this, this wattage, to bring down this electrical power. This is why godliness is concealed in this world because we're walking around, some of us have 100 watt, 100 watt bulbs, some of us has 200 watt bulbs, some 600 watt bulbs, but the divine lights have 100,000 watts, even more, infinite. So Ben Zoma had a prodigious mind, a 10,000 watt mind, but he got zapped with a million watts of divine light. So he didn't die, but he went crazy. He blew, all his fuses blew, all his mental fuses blew. So that he sits when says the Gemara, ben, Az, ben, ben Zoma, Ben Zoma, Ben Azai died on the spot. Ben Zoma, he took a glance of divine light and that was it, he was finished. And then comes Elisha Ben Abuya. Elisha Ben Abuya, he goes up there and he's brilliant. But he sees something that nobody else saw. He saw absolute good, mercy. And then he saw stern judgment, stern judgment, wars and death and disease and pandemics. And what? Elisha Ben Abuya, he said, that this, this, this is not fair. He's thinking, now remember, Elisha Ben Abuya did not listen to Rabbi Akiva. He did not put aside his human intellect. Now just imagine, can you ever see a human being that has the goodness of the Lubavitcher Rebbe or the Chofetz Chaim and the evil of Saddam Hussein in one person? Can you have that? Like, you can't have somebody like that. You saw somebody like that, somebody sits schizophrenic. Okay, so a person that's schizophrenic can be evil like Saddam Hussein, but a schizophrenic person can't be good like the Chofetz Chaim. Because the good of the Chofetz Chaim, that comes from holiness. He can't be good like the Lubavitcher Rebbe because that comes from holiness. Okay, but he could be evil. He could be evil. All right, but Ben Azai, he saw the good, the supreme good, he saw the supreme bad, and he said, uh-uh, this can't be. This can't be. Everything they tell, it's not true. Okay, the, 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 heaven forbid, Ron about to say, heaven forbid, there's not one God. Heaven forbid. Okay, this is what he said. And he came back down, a total heretic. He came down, the whole terror, Rabbi Akiva came down peacefully with his amuna intact, his life intact. Elisha Ben Abuya came down from a holy Tanaic sage, he became a heretic. He became a heretic. Not to become a heretic, he, he befriended the Romans and he made life miserable for people that were learning Torah. This would happen. Wow, wow. What he did. He could not understand. So why, how, where did Rabbi Akiva get the ability 
to see divine light, to, to see this divine oneness. And, and, and I think it hurt. Okay, we have to look at Rebbe Akiva's background. Before I mention that Rebbe Akiva was the student of the two greatest rabbis, that the whole Talmud stems from them, uh, Rabbi Shua ben Hananya and Rebbe Eliezer the Great. Okay. The Gemara, in the same tractate, Chagiga, that tells about the four that entered the orchard, the story I just told you, tells us that Rebbe Akiva spent 22 years learning by Nahumish Gamzu. Nahumish Gamzu got his name because his last name, Gamzu, this too. Nahumish Gamzu invented the expression Gamzu Tova. This is also for the good. And that's why people call him Gamzu. Even today in Israel, there's a last name called Gamzu, G-A-M-Z-U. People that, that that's a, the last name. This was the last name. This became his last name. He was probably the first one that ever had the last name of Gamzu. Okay. Nahumish Gamzu, this is the book. Nachomish Gamzu, everything. He went through tremendous difficulties in life, all for the best. So behold it. In all of the Talmud, all of the Talmud, all of the thousands of Talmudic laws given down in the Talmud, Nachomish Gamzu brought down one law. Nachomish Gamzu was a miracle worker. Nachomish Gamzu was the bulwark. He was the foundation of Amuna. There is probably ever since Abraham, there was no one that had the amuna of Nahumish Gamsu. So Rabbi Akiva left his two scholarly rabbis to learn amuna by Nahumish Gamsu. Now there's many more places in the Gemara that tell about Rabbi Akiva's amuna, how it was higher than even the greats of the generation. So why did Rabbi Akiva learn this amuna? Rabbi Akiva was better prepared than any of his contemporaries. Why? To enter the upper world because Rebbe Akiva knew how to put his intellect aside. He knew that emuna begins where intellect leaves less off, okay? Now, if we don't put intellect aside, we cannot fathom, we cannot fathom the concept of God is one. Uh, people say, uh, people say to me a lot of times, so Rabbi, yeah, I believe, I believe it's God is absolutely good, but God doesn't bring wars and God doesn't make diseases. Oh, and then who does? Who does? We learned last week that he alone did, does, and will do. But we don't understand. I explained last week how somebody that loves you could do something difficult. Nobody loves you like your army commander, like your athletic coach. Your army commander wants you to come home alive and whole. Come home to your wife and kitties, alive and whole. Your coach wants you to stand on the pedestal and get the gold medal and hear the national anthem of your country. Okay, that's what he loves you but on the way to being a champion and on the way to being a, a, a victorious soldier, it's a rough road. It's a rough road, it's not easy. They don't get that way for being chocolate ice cream. Okay, so we see that if the same commander and the same coach that love you, they're difficult. The same thing with Hashem. It's axiomatic that what Hashem does in our lives is all for the best. And if we had that emuna, we could have a smile on your face on the worst calamity. And that's the whole thing of Amuna. A person cannot be sane, really sane. We're, we're all crazy. We're all good. Without Amuna, we are all, there's no such thing as a sane person without Amuna. We hide it. One hides it better than another. But inside, inside, person can put on a good act and have anxiety. Body's not meant for anxiety and worry. Body's not meant for worry. Why we see if the anxiety and worry that create havoc to the digestive system, to the cardiovascular system, to the respiratory system, person breathes, breathes hard, it's not, they're not healthy. Negative emotions are not healthy. So wait a second, how come Hashem gives us negative emotions not healthy? Right, because we know, you know, in, in, in your refrigerator, if your refrigerator door is open, then the modern refrigerators, they got a buzzer, beep, you hear a beep. So you hear the beep to close the refrigerator. If you have a negative emotion, like when, when I know, when laser feels a negative emotion, oh, oh, something's wrong with your Muna. Check your Muna. Let's stop. Time out on the field. Okay, where's my Muna? No good. Because if my Muna were, were strong enough, I'd have a smile on my face. I know that everything is doing is from Hashem. Because what's a smile on your face? A smile on your face means that I like the way Hashem runs the world. And when a person doesn't have a smile on his face, I don't like the way Hashem runs the world. And that's why I see there's no such thing that a person says he believes in Hashem and not have a smile on his face. Otherwise, he doesn't believe in Hashem. Maybe it's not the same Hashem that I believe in. All right. So Rebbe Akiva, he knew the oneness of Hashem. 
because he took 22 years learning it with Nachomish Ganzu. Rabbi Akiva knew that the Torah is the light of Hashem. And you can't properly learn divine light with human intellect. <laughs> okay, you could learn finite, finite intellectual disciplines. Okay, physics is a finite discipline. Chemistry is a finite discipline. Mathematics is a finite discipline. You can learn that with a finite mind. But with the Torah, and people have done say I never learned Torah. What, what Torah is, Torah is, is beyond logic. That's why uh, and the kids come out of yeshiva and, and they go to law school. They finish a three-year law school in eight months, nine months. Because they know how to think. They know how to think. It's, 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 it's a deeper insight, a deeper insight. So where people don't have a muna is they looking at the world through physical eyes, through human intellect. And when one looks at the world through human eyes, through physical intellect, understands nothing. And that's why don't get your information from CNN, don't get your information from Fox News, we're not right, we're not left, we're not middle, we're not anything, okay? The place where you get our information from is from from Torah, from Dafyomi, and, and from this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah, it's, it's, it's amazing how this week's Torah portion talks just about what's happening in the world. Okay, but we see, we learn from Rabbi Akiva to focus on the oneness of Hashem, that Hashem is one, because the truth of Hashem's unity, Rabbi Akiva was worth it to have to sacrifice his whole life for that, and we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, but so where people deny, well, what's the darkness in the world? Darkness in the world is a denial of the oneness of creator or a total denial of Hashem's existence at all. Because when you have that, the world becomes a very dark place. Why? Because divine morality goes out the window and everybody decides what their own morals are. <laughs> you can see, uh, uh, people talk about democracy, but if one half of the democracy is empowered, then you disenfranchise the other half of democracy. That's not democracy. And democracy, uh, the, the, what the Greeks and the Romans did in the name of democracy, the, the, what they did to their enemies, democracy, that's a far cry from divine justice. Far cry. Ten Commandments is, that, 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 Ten Commandments is way above democracy. Way, way, way above democracy. Okay, and democracy, democracy is a finite idea. Okay, but a person come around, here you have right today, and we're not saying one thing, but right, right today in, in America, in the Democratic Party, half of the Democratic Party says, listen, uh, socialism is much more successful in democracy. Let's be socialist. Okay. You, you, we could see this, as you, you see this going around. As soon as it's human intellect, human intellect, different humans have different intellect, have different ideas. Okay, so the world is dark when we're dependent on human intellect and not on divine intellect. In other words, if everyone in the world described, subscribed to the Ten Commandments, what a nice place it would be. No murder, no stealing, no adultery. The Ten Commandments, that's all. We're not talking about anything else. Ten Commandments. Does anybody not agree to the Ten Commandments? Okay, anybody not, not agree? The Ten Commandments? Just Ten Commandments. Everybody agrees to that. What are they doing? For elaborate on the darkness, what this means. The Sfas Emes, that was the Holy Rebbe of Gur, he says, when light of Torah is revealed in the world, darkness is dispersed. And because the, and what happens when the darkness is dispersed? When darkness and world disperse, ah, we see divine unity. A divine unity, what divine divine unity is as it it's like one sun. I'm I'm only using metaphors because we're gonna learn next week. The Shem has no bodily properties, no physical properties, but have to use metaphors because we're human. And fine, but it, it, one sun, just like one sun shines, wherever you see sunshine in the world, you know what's from the one sun. And when there's divine unity, it's a splendid spiritual illumination in the world. What's spiritual illumination? Spiritual illumination is blessing. It means no sickness. It means no war. It means, uh, it, okay, but it's not a physical light that could be measured in so many watts or angstroms or uh, whatever, whatever unit you want to use, but it's abundance. Spiritual illumination is abundance. So according to Kabbalah, any deficiency in the world is an absence of divine light. That's what it is. Because King David says, Ki of, that there is no deficiency for those who are him. We say that 
in the blessing after meals. If you want to be rich, we did a, a podcast this week on the special spiritual qualities of saying grace after meals. Be careful about saying grace after meals and you'll have all the income. It's, it's a secret for good income. Okay, so if you don't say grace after meals, be sure to say grace after meals and, and you guarantee an income. And it can say, if you, you cook a nice meal for somebody, they don't say thank you. It's its, it's own thing. And Shem gives us, Shem feeds us and he wants us to say thank you. Okay, so there's five words. Ki ein makso lirayav. But in Lirayav is one word, but in English it's five words. The five words are for those who awe him. For those who awe him. I don't say fear because a lot of people translate Yirat Shemayim as fear of Hashem. It's awe of Hashem when you're awed by Hashem. It's not that you know, you're trembling and you're afraid the bolt of lightning is going to hit you. That's not, that's not the awe of Hashem, fear. And we're not talking about that. Lirayav. But if we take and play Hebrew Scrabble from he, those who fear him, which is one word, Lirayav. We could turn the letters around and says, Lee, oh, I have light. And this is what King David is hinting at, that the abundance of the world is divine illumination. So just as we said last week, that our first principle of Amunah corresponds to the first of the Ten Commandments. Our second, I am Lord your God. That's the first of the Ten Commandments. Okay. Then our second principle corresponds to the second of the Ten Commandments. You shall not have no other God before me. This is the unity of Hashem, Hashem only. And some people, uh, what do they, especially, they, they make their mistake. Okay. Where do idolaters make the mistake? People say, idolater, that's a stiff word, isn't it? You know, vast majority of the people in the world would be sorely insulted if you called them an idolater. But according to Torah, an idolater is attributing power to anyone or anything other than the creator, because that's a compromise of divine unity. I'll give you an example. Here you have the recent president, ele uh, president elections United in the United States that aren't officially over, okay, in November 2020. And, and an American citizen in Israel, he saw me walking so on the sidewalk and he ran up, he stopped me, he said, run my laser. Huh? Then he started yelling. I said, what, what's this guy yelling about? He said, the president lost the election. What's going to be with Israel? We're in big trouble. How can the American government let the election be stolen like that? It's terrible. He's scared us a little bit. Calm down, my brother. Calm down. And I looked at the guy. The guy was wearing a long beard and a black hat and a long black coat like I wear. And uh, I said to him, I say, my brother, do you believe in Hashem? He says, of course I do. I was insulted. I asked him that. He says, can't you see the way I look? And I said, wait a second. You say you believe in Hashem. So do you think that the Almighty is some little old frail grandmother up in the sky that can't do anything about the American elections? Oh, they're going to steal the election. He can't do anything. Is, is that what you think Hashem is? Okay. So... Guy, he wanted to show he's well-educated in Torah. He can answer Laser Brody. He says, well, what about free choice? Our religion gives us free choice? So he says that Shem doesn't take away free choice. Look, he had a good point, but it wasn't good enough. I said, you're correct, but 50% correct is 100% wrong. Uh, we have two mindsets. We have two mindsets. Free choice, we split it into two. Okay. Before we do something, we have to make our very best effort. In other words, if you've got your final exam, okay, you got that, uh, it's a, a B price is learning in the, in the university in the UK and she's got final exams tomorrow. Well, she can't go to the cinema with her friends and she can't go party tonight because she's got finals tomorrow. So B, you're gonna sit down and hit the books. All right, if you wanna pass that exam, no doubt about it. Okay, and, and that's it. If you've got uh, uh, my sister Sheila, she's got a business proposal to present. She is going to do her homework and she is going to know her stuff and she's going to anticipate the questions they're going to ask her and she's going to have all the fiscal information, all this, and she's not going to walk in there unprepared. She's going to get off her bike and come off the golf course and go into a business meeting and doesn't know who against who. She's going to prepare herself. Okay, now here's the thing. All right. B did her very best to study for exam, and Sheila did her very best to seal that particular client. Okay, that 
They did their best. That's it. Once you've done that, young lady, young man, you're finished. You're finished. You've done your job. You've done the very best. And then the rest is up to the almighty. So the first mindset is the a priori mindset, Latin, before the fact mindset. A priori means before the fact in Latin. Okay, that you, you, before you, you, you make your best effort. You make your best effort. You can't sleep until 11 in the morning and say, Hashem, where's my income? Where's my, no, get up early, pound the pavement, go to a minion, go pray, to start your day out spiritually, don't start your day out. I, I, I know a high friend in Oklahoma spoke to me this week. He said, Rabbi, I had a terrible day because I answered a business call before I prayed in the morning. Ooh. I said, well, that, that, that's a good thing. You gotta start off on the, on the right foot. Start off with feeding the soul and then the soul will take care of the body. You can have what you need, all right? So before we do something, we do our mechanism. For it. Once it's done, that's it, that's it. It's all up to the Almighty. Okay, so person, I tell the guy, person in America, you cast your vote, you're finished. You're finished. You need to break your head. This ballot, yes stolen, no stolen, this is it. Okay, if Hashem, let's decide, if Hashem did everything, the American election, it was fine, and Hashem put uh, President elect Biden in the office by, by fair means, the hunky dory, then why accuse otherwise? But if the accusations are true and he usurped the office, <laughs> there's divine justice. And I don't envy anybody who acquires anything by stealing. Because King Solomon, was we mentioned the wise of all men, King Solomon says, if anyone covets something, much more attains something that doesn't belong to him, then he will lose he is not only will he not get that, but he'll lose his own. Okay. So somebody don't, the person shouldn't take, shouldn't take a cent that belongs to somebody else because a cent that's very expensive. He'll lose a lot of his own. That's why we're very careful about doing commerce honestly and according to the statutes of Torah. I told this guy, here we go. This is, uh, uh, excuse me. This is something that we all have to be aware of. We make our best effort, but once it done, it's done. But, okay, so if a person blames himself or blames herself, that's not belief in one. It's belief you, you override Hashem. You override Hashem. Okay, so you succeed this time, we make another effort. We pray, we study harder, we work harder. You didn't you sell this house? Okay, you'll sell the next house. You didn't sell this client, you'll sell the next client. You didn't pass a test, you take a retest, you take a hundred on it. Do your best effort. All right. Now, there's a classic 15th century book about Emuna. It is very, very difficult to understand. And it, I don't think it's ever been translated. It's Sefer Karim by Rabbi Yosef Albo. Rabbi Yosef Albo was a Jew in the time of Spanish Inquisition. And it was a terrible, terrible time. And he went through a lot of torture. But <laughs> it's funny. It's just like in Rabbi Akiva's generation, the most difficult generations, we have the, the, the treasures. Okay. He writes in Sefer Ikarim, this is the book of principles, but it's the principal foundations of Amuna. he writes about. He says that attributing power to anyone or anything other than the Almighty is idolatry. It's not one God. Because someone made you by another deity. So continuing the line of thought, if we refer to the manner or oh, a person makes a living, and if a person thinks that he or she makes a living outside the framework of divine will, then that's idolatry. And Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, he explains this. He explains like this. Okay, let's suppose, let's suppose that Hashem is giving you $100,000 a year, okay? And this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son. This is, I want you to live on, make yourself a budget, live within these means. And a person says, what is Hashem talking about? I can't go to Bermuda, make a Bermuda vacation at, on $100,000 a year. I can't be a member of the country club or the yacht club with $100,000 a year. So I have to take the law in my own hands, heaven forbid. So people like that, that want more money than what they think, and they resort to dishonest means. In other words, a guy sells a house by lying. A guy sells a life insurance policy by lying. People do things by lying or, or by, by cheating or by shortchanging or their weights aren't proper. 
that's idolatry because he thinks that Hashem cannot make a living for him. So he's got to take the laws in his own hands. He places himself above the Torah, above Hashem. And, and this is what Rabbi Nachman explains when he is elaborating on the Sefer Kaim. Rabbi Nachman is in the 18th century, he's elaborating on the 15th century scholars. So throughout our history, our ancestors preferred to sacrifice their lives than make the slightest compromise in divine unity. And they were even awarded fabulous rewards of fortune and fame, whatever they would, if they would only do it. And if we look at our high holiday prayers, we have a prayer on high holiday, it's called Unatana Tokif. It's a very moving high holiday prayer. It was composed by a 13th century sage named Rabbi Amnon of Mainz. Okay. And Rabbi Amnon of Mainz, he was a brilliant Torah scholar, but he was also a nobleman. He was advisor to uh, he was advisor to the king. And as, as an advisor, the king loved him, but all the other advisors were very jealous. So they wanted to get at him. So they said to the king, they said, uh, the king or the duke, he was the, the nobleman that had that particular area of Germany. He was, he was the, the king over that area, that, that area. I don't know if they call him the king of the, the king of Mainz, the duke of Mainz, whatever he was called, one of the two. The other noblemen went to the king and they said, your majesty, you think he loves you? Oh, yes, he's loved and very loyal. Okay, your majesty, ask him to convert to our religion. Okay, he was said, he told him convert to Christianity. So uh, one thing, King was a little bit embarrassed because he knew that it was difficult for Rabbi Amnon to compromise his religion. But he says, Rabbi Amnon, do, do you love me? And he says, yes. He says, well, what will you do for me? He says, just about anything. He says, I want you to become a Christian. I want you to convert. Oh, and he was said, he says, your majesty, I, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. My my ancestors, we all died for our religion, can't do that. Okay, yeah, just, just asking. So King let it go a couple of days, but the ministers, they kept on saying, you see, your majesty, you see, try it again. So King was convinced by his ministers. So he said to Rabbi Amnon, every single day, Rabbi Amnon would come into, into the court, give him every single day, Amnon, I want you to convert. And he said, no, your majesty, no, you're so one day, he was just sick of being hounded by the king. I am going to convert, I'm going to convert, I'm going to convert every single day. He, so he said, he wanted to get the king off his back. He says, your majesty, give me three days to think about it. Ah, the king said, that's what I've been waiting for. Okay, go home and think about it. Well, Rebbe Amnon went home and he was brokenhearted. He said, I should doubt Hashem. I should doubt Hashem's oneness. What in their religion, they have a Shem and they have a, a son and they have a, a, a deity and they have a, a Holy Ghost. They have all these other things that, that go along with it. Say, I should doubt that. We only have a Shem. There's nothing else but a Shem. No one but a Shem. And this is what the Rabbah tells us. No one but a Shem. No one but a Shem. This, by the way, uh, in Islam, there's also no one but a Shem. A Jew is allowed to walk inside a mosque. A Jew can pray. I can pray inside a mosque. Uh, the Marat Machpelah, it's inside a mosque. Uh, Samuel the prophet's tomb, there's also a, a Shul Nikola, it's inside a mosque. You can go inside a mosque and pray because they don't have what's we call Shituf, it's a code deity. In Judaism, there's no code deity, it's only a Shem. And the, the, the Muslims, they have no code deity, so there's no idolatry in, in a mosque. So a, a Jew, in case you, you won't find a local million mincha there, but uh, if, you, if you want to pray, you can pray inside a mosque. It's permissible. But a Jew cannot walk inside a church because a Jew cannot walk inside any place where there is anything other than one God. And of course, it's, it's, called, it's called idolatry. So die for it. But now Rabbi Amnon went home and he said, how can I even hesitate? Why did I say three days? He did not eat for three days. He fasted for three days. And he did chuva. I'm sorry, Hashem, for doubting you. I'm sorry, Hashem, for doubting you. So after three days, after three days, the king summoned Rabbi Amnon. Amnon, where are you? He says, I can't go. I can't go to the palace. So the king sent soldiers to bring him. He said, the soldiers, no, I can't go. He's a nobleman. So the soldiers went back, said, he's not coming. They sent officers. Then he said, officers, the officer had come. So the third time, the king said, bring him in chains. They brought him from the king in chains. 
And the king said to Amnon, Amnon of Mainz, Rebbe Amnon, why did you not come back at the appointed time after three days? He says, your majesty, the tongue that spoke something that wasn't true, you could cut it off. So the king of Maine said, no, the tongue spoke true, but the fingers and the feet that didn't come to me, that I will cut off. So they took the sergeant of arms, I'm sorry to be graphic, but one by one, cut off the extremities, 10 fingers one by one, 10 toes one by one, and after each one said, Amnon, will you convert? Said, no, it was excruciating torture, excruciating torture. And after all 20 were cut off, they put him up in salt and put him in a cloth, put him in a stretcher with him and sent him home. This was the day before Rosh Hashanah. The day before Rosh Hashanah. And see, the day before Rosh Hashanah, it's a day of martyrs. It's a day of martyrs. There are stories about special people that leave this world the day before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, one of like Hannah Callan, she says the, the evening before Rosh Hashanah, she she left this world, but, and uh, with no a gorgeous gorgeous young girl, gorgeous she, she just left, boom, finished, that's it, checked out. Shem needed her upstairs. Okay, but the special martyrs. This was the day before Rosh Hashanah. The next day was Rosh Hashanah, and Rabbi Amnon was all but delirious, losing consciousness, so much pain and loss of blood. But he asked his family, please take me to the synagogue. They took him on a stretcher with his fingers and his toes wrapped up next to him. They took him to the synagogue and he asked the rabbi, Rabbi, I want to go up to the Holy Ark. So he went up to the Holy Ark. Okay. And he went up to the Holy Ark and he said this prayer that we say on Rosh Hashanah, on the Tana Tokif. Oh, it's such a moving prayer. Yeah, you can't say it with a dry eye. <laughs> if I'm, 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 disorient myself I said this prayer but he said this prayer that we say until today okay and after he said the prayer he said Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad and when he said Echad one hero Israel Hashem is God Hashem is one right in the middle of Yom Kippur in the middle of Shul as Neshama left him that's it this is how our sages considered oneness of Hashem one, it was all life, understand, not understand. So back, I told you about Rabbi Akiva, that he went in. So now what, what people ask, what did today? People ask, why did Rabbi Akiva leave his two academic rebbes to go learn Amunah for 22 years? What, and we could have learned more and more religious law in 22 years. And even before Rabbi Eliezer died, he said to Akiva, Akiva, you didn't learn from me as much as a dog licks water from the sea. You can learn 10 months. Okay, but Rabbi Akiva learned something that nobody else but Nahumish Gamzu, Amuna. And this is what he tied for him. Everything was Amuna. Hashem Okeno Hashem Echad. All his Torah, everything was in the, in the Amuna. So now we're going to describe Rabbi Akiva's last day on earth. Rabbi Akiva was rounded up by the Romans for teaching Torah in public, which was against the law. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva it says, he can't, what's a life without Torah? No life without Torah. So the Romans imprisoned him, and it's a criminal act, teaching Torah, this is a criminal act, and this is the Roman democracy, but Torah is a criminal act. Okay, so what did they do? Between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Rabbi Kiva's yard site is the fifth of Tishrei, right in the middle between the 10 days of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, some say, it, it was on Yom Kippur itself, but I think it's more accurate that it was the 5th of Tishrei and not the 10th of Tishrei on Yom Kippur. They put Rebbe Akiva on a gallow and they tied him, but they didn't hang him. They sent the Roman sergeant of arms with a big rake, like imagine a rake, the rake leaves, but the forks on the rake were knives. And they raked, this is the Gomorrah Tractate Brochus, okay, at the end of Tractate Brochus, they raked his flesh off. This, we read this Gomorrah every year at Tisha B'Av. We lament the wives. I can't read this Gomorrah without crying. Especially, we love Rebbe Akiva. You know, Rebbe Akiva is, love him so much. And King David, love him so much. And the love, what King Solomon says, this is a greater, greater than any love you can imagine. How would I say?
But the Romans were so sadistic that they took Rebbe Akiva's students and held their heads, one soldier in the head, and forced them to look at the Rebbe. I can tell you how much a person loves a spiritual guide and a Rebbe. I know it, it, it's what I pray three times a day that the Melitzer Rebbe, not my Rebbe, should be. He should be alive until 120, until Mashiach, even later than all that. He can't, can't consider. Can't consider. Just, your, your parents bring you to this world, but your Rebbe brings you to the next world. Okay. He made Rebbe keep his students look and watch this torture. And they were screaming, Rebbe, how can you? Rebbe Kiva had a smile on his face. The worst torture that uh, the North Koreans can't imagine, can't dream up a torture like this, what the Romans did. Rebbe Kiva's got a smile on his face. Rebbe, how can you smile? They're all screaming. You know what Rebbe Kiva told them? It's right out of the Gemara. Rebbe Kiva said, I have been preparing myself my entire life for this moment. Now that it's come, I'm going to be unhappy. This is my thing. This is, this is what I, with the, all the Torah, the father of the Talmud, the father of the Torah, the greatest mind, everything. What the Gemara Tractate Menachah says, a greatest mind, even greater than Moses. Greater than Moses. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. Rabbi Kiva says, no, this is what he's preparing himself for. Because this is the epitome of Amuna, knowing that we have one God, knowing, believing in this one God. And you can get to this belief only by way of Amuna. And that's why we're learning Amuna. Okay. So in order to understand this concept of divine unity within our sorely limited human intellect, we have to realize that where intellect ends, Amuna begins. So we put aside our intellect. Now we can understand that pain and suffering, everything Hashem does is all for the best. I can't begin to understand why bad things happen to good people if I don't learn a Muna. We're gonna get, by the time we hit the 13th principle, we understand how, how death, is a, death is a great thing. Death is a really good thing. We're lamenting, who are, are we, when someone, heaven forbid, we've lost, I know, I've lost some very close people with COVID-19. The Pittsburgh Rebbe, I loved him. We were such good friends. Uh, Rebbe Rafael Ben Ami, the rest of a singer. It, it's, uh, close, close friends. Okay. But what, sorry for them. Sorry for me. They're in a great place. Where, where the Pittsburgh Rebbe is? I can't even imagine where, where David Rafael Ben Ami is. And they made so many people so, so much joy for so many people. Okay. So we said, Look who's standing behind that, that champion athlete. It's a tough coach. And look who's standing behind that winning soldier. That's a tough commander. And that's why we know this begins to help us understand that we have a loving father standing by us. Okay. And as we go and we continue learning a Muna, that this father is one. Just like a person has one father, only one father. You can't have more than one father. One actual physical father. Okay, people have adopted fathers, people have foster parents, but there's only one father, and that's it. And that's the advice. When I say one father, Hashem is up above. I could say I could say one mother. Our, I could say our beloved mother in heaven. And, and don't people get mixed up when they say uh, uh, that they talk about the Holy One and the Divine Presence. The Holy One and the Divine Presence are one. The Holy One and the Divine Presence are one. It's just like explain to you if, uh, if, if if we see who's writing that note that you're writing down. Oh, that's your pen writing. No, that's not your pen. No, that's your handwriting. No, that's not your hand. That's your arm writing. No, that's not your hand. Oh, that's you writing. Oh, but who's the you? No, that's a brain impulse. What's it inside there? That's your soul telling your body what to do. Okay, so the, your your fingers are not a separate entity from all the way up to the soul. That's all you. That's all you. This is all part of you. And the same thing, we see divine manifestations down in this world, but it's all from the soul. The soul, as we will learn next week, has no bodily properties because it's a tiny part of the Almighty that he has no bodily properties. So with it, we're going to hold up on our second principle next week. God willing, on Wednesday night, we're going to learn the third principle. So once again, we learn that Echad Yochid Umyuchad, Hashem is the one and only the one and only, that's all you have to remember, the second principle of Muna, there's only him, he alone.